Hey everybody, we are live today with Grace Clapham from The Change School. And if you guys are watching uh, the training here from our other social channels, uh, come here at Crowdcast where it's a bit more fun to collaborate with us in here. Um, if you're seeing us on our YouTube, YouTube channel or our Facebook page or I don't know how many more pages we've got out there. Uh, but if you're seeing me and Grace's face streaming into your mobile phones or your laptop, please join us at Crowdcast uh, for our How to Make a Bold Career Move uh, webinar chat today. It's going to be a fun little interactive chat show where we, dis uh, we are discussing the transition uh, for corporate professionals that are coming from... Um, long careers. Grace and I both had uh, over decades worth of careers in um, the industries we've been in. It's hard for uh, change to happen uh, for a lot of us professional people that have been in this traditional trajectory of a particular success path we're used to. So uh, this is going to be a very powerful conversation for us today. Uh, and if you come over here on Crowdcast, which you'll see in a link below, any of the videos that you see streaming on our social channels will lead you straight to our Crowdcast room where you can actually uh, ask questions here, collaborate, with us and ideas we're going to be talking about today and discussing. Uh, and as, as I said, the fun is all mostly here on Crowdcast. Now, if you're in Crowdcast, uh, you'll see Bettina uh, hosting our chat box here. Bettina is my online business manager and our community ambassador, making sure that you're taken care of when it comes to your questions uh, and anything that we can support you on today. Um, you can definitely uh, ping Bettina in the chat box to uh, find where to post a question, where to answer our polls, uh, aware any links that we talk about today. She's going to be um, definitely in there uh, navigating and facilitating that chat box. But if you're here today, please say hello and introduce yourselves. I'm in Vancouver today and Grace is in Singapore. We are in multiple time zones. We've got Sophie from Jakarta, <laughs> uh, Indonesia, Sophie Gorecki. Hi, Sophie. Uh, and if you're here today as well, let us know what you're most excited to learn about making a bold career move uh, for your future career. And what big questions do you have? Uh, we love to do polls during our webinar chat shows to find out how we can serve you better and how we can actually create uh, even better content. And all our content on our, on our webinars are always free uh, and here to serve you. But it helps us to know where you're at in your career transition. So today's question of the day is, what obstacles do you face when deciding on a career move? So if you click on the polls question, you'll be able to vote on that poll question. Um, Perhaps you felt you felt that you've wasted many years of your hard work and experience, and that's a big obstacle that you face. I definitely um, uh, struggled with that when I first transitioned. Uh, or is it that you've dissatisfied with your career but don't know what move is better? Um, or if you want to start a successful business, but I'm sorry, I want to start a business, but I'm afraid I won't be successful. Uh, that is our highest ranking vote so far right now. Uh, maybe you're afraid to tell friends and family about your career change, right? Fear of judgment, uh, or I don't want to give up a cushy salary, right? Uh, a, a sure thing, financial cushion, which is always one of the biggest reasons why people don't take that leap. We're going to talk a lot about that today with Grace. Uh, so definitely um, give us your vote on the poll so that we can learn more about what obstacles that you face as well. Hi, Kay. Lovely to see you. And let us know where you're from and what you're most excited to learn today. Now, before I introduce Grace, our special guest today, I uh, want to do a bit of housekeeping in Crowdcast in case you do ha you're not familiar with this platform. Um, if you're here on Crowdcast, joining us from our other social channels, uh, please share our webinar training to anyone that you know uh, in your communities that would benefit from this awesome conversation all about bold career moves. You can click on the invite button on the top right-hand corner above uh, me and Grace's head up top in the Crowdcast pl platform, and you can share this in LinkedIn. Uh, you can share it on, on Facebook uh, or Twitter, whatever's your poison, uh, but help us spread the, the word um, on that there are a, an army of us <laughs> looking to escape the nine to five uh, and there is help a coming so we're going to be talking about that all today and uh, they can also watch the replay and you can also watch the replay if you can't join us for the entire training today uh, that's not a problem because the same link will bring you to our replay as well uh, at Crowdcast. And make sure that you're watching this uh, chat show today uh, using our, uh, a Chrome browser. This seems to work best uh, with the Crowdcast platform. And so if you're on Safari or anything else, uh, I would love to encourage you to actually get on Chrome so there's no um, interruptions and disruptions in the way that we are streaming here today. Uh, and then use the chat box to really share your insights as you hang out with us today in today's Tribe Talk uh, and share your own experience of, of your career transition or big questions that you have, because very likely someone here is probably experiencing uh, something very similar to 
Okay, um, so what is the Tribe Talk? If you're here for the first time, um, Tribe Talks are basically what we run once a month here at Screw the Cubicle to really invite uh, influencers, experts, and fellow unconventional humans uh, to discuss big ideas for the new future of freedom-based careers and lifestyles. So if you're at a career crossroad and unsure of what your next step may be, uh, you have come to the right webinar. Uh, and if you're scared to take your leap out of your current professional career, uh, you're not alone either. Uh, so the stats show that the average Average person will make a career change approximately five to seven times during their working life. And so by the age of about 42 years old, you will probably have had about 10 jobs. So I would love for you guys to share in the chat box how many jobs you already have so far. Grace, do you remember how many jobs you've had now in your LinkedIn profile? I've oh, had yeah. about 12 jobs so far. <laughs> I counted the other day. And that includes my first babysitting job, okay? <laughs> um, so if you are in, you know, in the new future of work, these, this whole, you know, normalization of career shifts are, you know, it is the new normal, right? It's not it, it, gone are those uh, days for our parents, for example, where you do stick to a particular career for, you know, 50 years or so and wait for your pension to kick in. Uh, things have changed for a lot of us uh, in these days when technology uh, is now our new reality. What we can now do for work has been a lot more easier to change careers, uh, to start businesses. You don't have to invest as much, uh, you know, huge money into a business anymore um, because we can have digital businesses now. Uh, but we have to be prepared to pivot, right, in our new approach and our strategies uh, to get the work life that we want. So if you're ready to make a bold career move without compromising your financial security of lifestyle, uh, today's interactive and insightful conversation with Grace Clapham, uh, the co-founder of The Change School, will be super, super valuable for you. Um, so without further ado, I'm going to introduce our Tribe Talk guest, Grace. Uh, Grace is an award-winning entrepreneur who in 2014 uh, won the Inspirational Leadership Award at the Talon Unleashed Awards, judged by Sir Richard Branson and Steve Wozniak. In 2013, she co-founded The Change School, uh, which is a school for self-empowerment and positive transformation that helps people navigate through life changes and in particular career change. Uh, so Grace is passionate about connecting people to themselves and the world around them in order to catalyze conscious change and redesign their lives with meaning. Uh, music to my ears. <laughs> so I'm so excited to have Grace with us today. Uh, thank you, Grace, for taking time out of your busy schedule. I know you're a new mom and you've warned me that baby could be screaming in the background <laughs> in this webinar. Uh, uh, so I really am appreciative um, of you being here. No worries. Thanks so much for having me, Lydia. I'm super excited. And I know my PIC Salonia is um, really, you know, sad to be missing this out. Yeah, so it's usually a, a, a trilogy. It's three of us usually having a, a nice talk together. Uh, Salonia is, is um, the, the other co-founder of The Change School, now currently based in, or sorry, she's visiting Portugal, isn't she? So she couldn't yeah. join us on this particular time zone. Uh, but I would love to sort of start with, for people who don't know who you are and sort of what The Change School is about, why does Change School even exist, and why should people care? Uh, what Can you tell us briefly about why you as Salonia started The Change School and what's your vision uh, for the future of work? Yeah, sure. I mean, the change goal really came about from our own personal needs. And I think, you know, Salonia and I were, were, were old friends and we were going down parallel lives um, in many ways. I was running my other business at that time and Salonia was um, working in PR and comms in Singapore. And both of us were feeling a little misaligned with what we were doing, but just didn't know what we were looking for next or what we wanted to do next. And, you know, we had the conversation around work-life balance, work-life integration, all of these sort of things. And one thing we realized is that we were wanting something that was more aligned with our values. And, um, you know, we always say, a yoga retreat wasn't enough and an MBA wasn't <laughs> enough as well. So, or wasn't what we were looking for. So we were trying to find something that combined the two and change school or, um, you know, the change school started mainly with retreats um, in particular for people looking for a career change um, and looking to shift into, you know, their next phase of their career. So it really came, it was born out of our own personal needs and, um, it has evolved since then. And, you know, we are very much working within the career segment, as you know, we are as well. Um, and it's not only for people who are, <clears throat> sorry, sorry, working to leave their careers, but are also looking to repackage or reinvent their assets 
for their future self in whatever shape or form that may be, whether it's internally within an organization, you know, or the same organization or shifting into a new role, or as you said, you know, um, quitting their nine to five. Mm. Um, so that's really what the change goal is now. I guess our future and vision for the change goal is really to be a place for change so that no matter what, at any pivotal moment of your life, um, you know, we have tools, products, experiences for change, um, whether it's from us, by us, or by others that we collaborate with. I know we've collaborated ourselves, you know, um, right. in the past, and hopefully there's ways for us to do that in the future. So really being that school for change. Um, and, you know, right now we have tools and experiences online um, and offline for change, but the goal would be to create a more broader um, range of products for individuals moving through key pivotal moments of change. Awesome. I mean, how we were connected was that you were doing a retreat in Bali and uh, we now share the same business coach as well, Pam Slim, which is awesome. Uh, but one of the things that I sort of realized when I attended and, and actually spoke at one of your events in Bali was that there was such a huge array of people from different backgrounds, different um, cultural backgrounds as well and professional backgrounds that were um, all you know have something in common which was being very completely dissatisfied right with yeah. that trajectory of their career uh and have worked very hard they've had they've been in debt trying to pay off their student loans and hope yeah. you know crossing fingers that the degree that they you know now are a hundred thousand dollars in debt is hopefully that degree that leads them to the pension plan and the and yeah. you know what we what our parents taught us yes. was sort of the safe plan um, totally and I know you work with a lot of people in Singapore and I, I have sort of uh, a background, you know, I was born in Malaysia. I understand the culture in Singapore, uh, but I also find that even when I go and speak in London or, you know, Vancouver or wherever it is that we talk about career change and fears that happen with that, it's actually pretty common across the board, mm -hmm. whether you're a Canadian or a British person or someone from Singapore. And I'm sure you've heard all sorts of different um, fears and excuses, right? Why people uh, are afraid to take that leap right? Yeah. Uh, or have uh, been this dream that's been sort of in the back burner for so long, and they keep waiting for the perfect time to take that leap. Um, now, gathering yes. all that intel of, you know, feedback and the most common fears that have ever come into your vicinity in the last few years of working with people in career transitions, uh, what are some of those top fears that people have about career transitions? And how do we need to think about these problems differently? Yeah, I think um, it's so true, no matter what culture, um, you know, or background we have, like you said, some of the most common things that we see is is um, self-worth. Um, so and and confidence, right, which comes down to really like self-esteem. And um, and I think, you know, from that also, we are so used to being in control or wanting to seem like we are in control and coming from myself, who also is a control freak, I totally get it, right? Mm -hmm. um, so I think there's the self-worth, the, the self-confidence side of things or a lack of confidence. And the other is the lack of uncertainty and therefore lack of, um, you know, control. And I think those are probably the, the top three that we see. Um, and really, you know, sure, surface level, it's I don't know if I have the skills or I don't have the experience or right. I've never, you know, I don't have networks or all of those sort of things. But when we dig deeper, the, the concerns that we see are actually that self-doubt, limiting beliefs, all of that. Right. Mm -hmm. um, and I think it's something because we're never taught confidence or self-worth at a young age. So it is only human nature that as we grow and as we become comfortable in certain environments, if you've been in a professional career for 10 years, 17 years, whatever it is, right? To shift completely, oh. it's gonna shake all your rocks, right? Your foundations no. are gone and you are not X from company at Y, right? Oh. You are, who are you? So I think, um, you know, what people need to really look at is one, I am a huge believer in value investing in yourself. Um, and, you know, that's how I came across Pam. Sol and I both, we, we are avid believers of investing in ourselves, whether it's through support groups, support systems, masterminds, you know, coaches, counselors, cheerleaders, whatever it is, it's really creating that support network and system. Oh. And we sort of tend to talk about like your five C's of impact. So it's like, um, you know, five circles for impact and influence, which is cheerleaders, challengers, community, change agents, and um, God, I'm going to forget this last one because I always do. <laughs> uh, but <laughs> courage. 
<laughs> yeah, yeah, courage. No, so it's um, cheerleaders, challengers, communities, or successful career shifters, right? Mm -hmm. um, coaches or counselors and change agents. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, within each of those, you would have people that can support you in moving forward. And I think, um, you know, the goal is to re reframe our mindset in how we look at change. Right. Mm -hmm. um, it is a positive. There are po amazing opportunities that we are yet to know. And, um, you know, the path to change, it's about the process and wherever you need to get to. Um, it's the process that we need to take into consideration because the end destination may may change. Right. Um, right? So I think that's really the best. Excellent. And, and I mean, here's the thing about fears. I, I think a lot of times, you know, I've always described fears as there's a missing gap of information, right? An insight that doesn't actually mean it's the end of the road, right? But there's a lot of insight in fear. Uh, but if we sort of stop at the first layer of fear, right, which is yeah. just, okay, I'm not supposed to do that. It feels horrible. I'm having like total butterflies in my belly. I just stop where it is. We just never go on an adventure, right? But if we actually understand uh, what fear is trying to tell us in terms of what it is we have to learn, what it is that we have to get clear on, you know, what it is that we have to um, be better at that actually uh, is sometimes quite an insightful conversation we can have with, you know, different fear parts that we have instead of actually just going, well, if it feels bad, I'm not supposed to do it. Mm -hmm. Right. And, 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 and then you don't sort of do anything at all. Uh, so Sophie says in the chat box, I perform best within organized structure. And she's afraid that losing the nine to five time frame might lead me to become disorganized and lose focus. Right. <laughs> I mean, lots of your guys definitely feel that way. I mean, I, I definitely have a lot of people that um, when I coach with them, you know, one of the biggest things that they have is not being able to manage time, yeah. right? And they're afraid that if they're already struggling with that now, yes. um, it could be hard to do that in the future for them. Uh, what would be your advice, um, Grace, for someone like Sophie who has that fear around um, being unstructured? You know, it's been so long that you go to work a certain time, you're expected to be at work, you're committed at work, but then when you're your own boss, all of a sudden it's like you've got to be breathing down your own neck <laughs> in that sense. Um, what's your yeah. advice about that? Look, I think, um, you know, it's it's not so much the time that you spend working. So it's like, okay, just because you set aside eight hours a day doesn't mean that you're going to be productive over those eight hours, right? Mm. So I think what we always like to say is if you better understand yourself, right? Um, so the more self-awareness you have, the more realistic you're gonna be able to design that life, right? And that means that maybe you're best to work earlier in the morning for three hours, but actually you're probably gonna get 80% of the work that you need to get done in those three hours versus having to go in you know, for eight hours, but maybe only really productively being, you know, productive for two hours, right? Mm. So I think on the one hand is, is again, it starts with a mindset. It's reframing the way that we look at time on the one hand, yeah. right? And being like, just because we are dedicating eight hours does not mean we are producing um, in eight hours or effectively okay. using our time in that eight hours, you know? And I would say the next thing is to set up a system, a support system, right? It's like, Having one thing we've realized and, and, you know, from the work that we've done is if people do it self-paced with our online course, say, or whatever it is that we're working through in a self-paced version, you really need the motivation and the drive to make it happen. Right. And um, if you don't have the motivation and the drive, then it's about creating the right support systems to enable you to start moving forward. And that is the accountability, right? The structure, those sort of things until you start breaking your habits your bad habits or creating new habits and routines and structures. And, you know, I think um, just to answer, you know, or share a little bit more with what you said, Lydia, is like there's a statistic that this lady Jensen Saro shared and um, it's in her book called You Are a Badass. And she Ooh, writes yeah, that well, only 5% of people will make a change, whether mm. it's your diet, your weight, I mean, your food or sports or well-being or changing careers, whatever it is, it's 5% of people will make a change no matter what, right? That means like without any pivotal things happening. 95% of people will not make the change until something drastic or life-changing or pivotal or like major happens to them. Mm. So, you know, that's where I kind of look at it and I'm like, where do you sit? In the 5% or the 95%? And that's okay. But if you're in the 95%, then that is where you need and coaches or systems or step-by-step -step processes 
or a support group, networks, whatever it is to help you move forward. Um, mm. And it's not a weakness, it's a strength to acknowledge that. Right? Yeah, absolutely. And I, I, I'm someone that wish I knew that when I first started, you know, being a, a self-starter yeah. and actually being very type A perfectionist, it wasn't in my nature to ask for help and ask for support. Uh, but we need each other. We need other humans that actually one of the biggest inspirations for me was actually moving away from just reading all the books and looking at all the videos and actually start getting out there and meeting real humans that are living a life that I dream to live, right? Mm -hmm. Not just getting advice from anyone, but actually super respecting yeah. a particular people that build a business or, you know, design a lifestyle that I can imagine. Yeah, I would love to trade shoes with them. You know, like I would love to be in their world and the way that they do that um, really aligns with the values that I have as a human, you know, and that actually changes completely what becomes a reality. Mm -hmm. I think in your life, when you can meet a real human and go, that person's no different than me. You know, they're mm -hmm. not more educated than I am. They don't have a silver spoon in their mouth, you know, but what, what it, they committed to was their saying yes, right, yeah. to a different life and actually committing to all the ups and downs that comes with that and learning what those ups and downs look like so that I'm prepared Absolutely. to uh, deal with those expectations w when they arise. Yeah. Um, so I think, you know, this sort of brings it really nicely to my next question, which is that, you know, while you are in a full time job, um, while you are actually in a secured position of a full time paid salary, for example, is in my opinion that this is usually the best time to prepare for the leap, mm -hmm. right? When you feel safe, because we on the baseline, right, Maslow's hierarchy of needs, um, we need to feel safe in order to do uh, particular things like creativity, take risks, go out there and play, right, go experiment with certain things. We can't activate that part of who we are as a human until our baseline needs are met. And one mm -hmm. of our baseline needs are once one of the C's community. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Right. Yeah. We need to feel safe that there's other yeah. people that have our backs in totally. case we fuck it up. Um, yeah. There'll still be people to pick us up and, 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 and wrap us up right mm -hmm. in a nice blanket yeah. and go, you're fine. <laughs> like, yeah. Go up there, like dust you off and yeah. go back out there again. Right. But if we don't have that community, we don't have somewhere safe, right. Those yeah. conditions, that in place where we can go out there and fuck it up and get, you know, sort of marred and bruised, we're not going to take that leap of faith because there's no one there to hold us accountable or hold us in a safety position when that mm -hmm. happens. Now, what are some other things besides creating, right, curating the right community to support us through that transition? Uh, what are other things that you believe are uh, things that people should start considering uh, when they're about to make these, you know, bold career moves or experiment with a business or a side hustle launch or whatever it is they, that they do? What are some ways that we can minimize our risks when we're changing careers? And what do we need to sort of prepare uh, whether it's environmentally, uh, on a mindset level, or something practical, uh, while we are changing careers? Yeah, I think that's such a good question, you know, and I think it's, um, you know, maybe two, three years ago, people would have thought, just quit your job before you have a safety, um, before you have a safe runaway or a safety net or whatever it is. But actually, if I look back on things, I wish I had done it differently, for sure. Um, you know, I, I, I quit my job with no idea what I was going to do. Um, right. and probably like $4,000 in my bank account at that time. And I was like, holy shit. You know? <laughs> yeah. So I mean, <laughs> yeah, totally. And, and I kept doing certain things, um, and that made me more stressed, but I, I also am more risk. Uh, I like to take more risks on that side. Right. So Ooh. I think these days, um, it's about minimizing your, uh, career change as much as possible until you build that confidence in which direction you want to go in, right? Because I've we've also seen that a lot too, where people start businesses for the wrong reasons and they're in Ooh. it and they're in the trenches. And if you get that, you know, going initially, but you don't have the desire or purpose to keep you going, you're going to burn out um, no matter what, right? So I think for us, we're always about how do you create a career pilot plan? And it's around, you know, we test drive cars. So why should we not test drive career shifts, right? Or the next direction that we want to go into. So what we always look at is try and look at three lives 
that you might be interested in, right? Mm. One might be more the realistic one. Next might be a mid-level dream. The third might be a, you know, you're out there kind of desire, right? Whatever it is, you, you would choose three potential career lives based on certain motivators, drivers, interest, and having that sense of who you are and what really tick, ticks your boxes, and then create a 60 or 90 day career pilot plan. And what that might look like, for example, is in the first month, you might want to test, say, if you're shifting from you know, teaching to a, the communications industry, let's just say, right? That first month might be, you know, speaking to 50 people and doing informational interviews around what it's like to be in the communications industry or in that role, what are your duties and jobs are, what types of positions are there that's just more than what we think is already out there. Second might be to take a sick day um, and shadow someone in the industry, right? Um, and And really see what that, that looks like, right? The third thing that you might do in that month is is maybe even volunteer and take a week off um, in your paid time off and volunteer somewhere else to help, um, you know, a social enterprise or a startup or whatever it is in that role and see whether or not that resonates for you. Mm. The second month, you might be testing out your second career live, right? That's an option to do it that way. And the third month might be testing your third career, um, your third career lives. Um, However, you could also do them simultaneously or in parallel, just depending on how much time you have, right? But for for us, piloting your career plan just allows you to feel more confident. Mm. Do you even like it? it. You know, we've had a student that was thinking she was going to be a teacher, um, but then was like, okay, the gaps of what I do know versus what I need to get to are really big. And I Mm. will need some type of, you know, um, certification, but do I even like it before I dive into the certification? And she shadowed someone a couple of times and realized it's not what she wants right now. Mm. Maybe in like 10 years time. (laughs) Yeah. I mean, I, I totally agree. And I think the, I mean, I, I call that sort of the beta testing guinea pig round, right? Yeah. Of test. It's almost like trying on a coat and going, mm, how does that feel? Because yeah. at the end of the day, things could look amazing on paper. And, and it's something that you, you know, you know, you might really respect someone that you love as an influencer and you think that you want to be them yeah. until you actually see what a day in the life of <laughs> yeah. looks like. And all of a sudden that job doesn't feel so sexy, right? Yeah. Or it doesn't feel as attractive as it looks from the outside when you actually break down what activities and tasks that person actually specializes in. Um, I mean, in a way we did that in our traditional way of education, right? Internships yes. are not new, right? And, and yeah. how we've sort of got to know a particular industry or a career. And I think it's such a great uh, point that you made there that when you're about to shift into diff- uh, uh, experimenting with a different alternative career, of course, you're not going to know if that's a for sure thing yeah. until you gave it a test drive, right? Until sure. you could intern in some way, in, in a way that allows you to be in that day in the life of, right? Of yeah. that role. Um, what I did, just to share a little quick story, stories that like when I first uh, started my first agency in um, international education was uh, my industry that I was in. Right. And I only I knew what I had to do there to make a bit of money. And I was I had my transition business all set up before I even quit my job. Super like safety, Sarah. Right. Like that was my middle name. (laughs) Safety, Sarah. Uh, But as my interest became more into like exploring meaning and purpose and sort of like could work also feel good, like besides just making money. um, That's when I started the blog. Right. Screw the cubicle was obviously now became become my primary business. But I, too, had that question like would I be really irritated at humans if I help them with their personal problems? Maybe I don't actually want to help them. Maybe I just want to blog forever in this realm. But, you know, being a coach felt like an extra step and and certifications and all sorts of things that I I may not want to invest in. Um, So I did a beta test. I took on eight guinea, guinea pig clients for two months where I was very honest about it. It was free. And I said, listen, I, here's what I've done in my own life. I have no idea if that's going to help you until we go there. And that may or may not help you. And I'm not sure, but we're going on a bit of an adventure together for two months. You're going to have my heart and my brain for those two months and whatever happens from this, hopefully there's a positive exchange in this regard. Right. And you can do that. Actually, I wish I did that while I was still working full time, you know, but I sort of did that as I was transitioning. But in hindsight, that would have felt better because then when I did quit my job, I would sort of be already have stepped into those shoes. Yeah. You know, um, what are other ways that you've seen or you've maybe coached your own clients on the beta test 
part of testing out and road testing ideas? I mean, I think, you know, definitely on the side hustle, we, we probably, you know, have overlapping an audience in the sense that for sure, where people want to run their own business, they would, you know, really value the work that you do. Right. And I think there are more people who are running their own starting to run their own businesses. Um, so it's like we're shifting from maybe conglomerates to more, um, you know, small businesses of individuals, right? Um, and what we see on that side, hustles, you know, it's great to start a side hustle when you're still at work, as long as there is no conflict of interest, obviously, with the work that you do. But it allows you to do it with no pressure, Right. And to be able to go, you know what, I can still have fun with this and I can build it in and know that maybe in six months, this is where I want to plan to get to. Right? right. But then it's like, how do you turn it into a business? And I think that's where your help in regards to the work that you do empowers them to look at systems and structures and really turning a side hustle into a business. Mm. Right. Um, so I, I mean, you know, for me, I think minimizing career change in general has, you also have to be realistic to yourself. Um, you know, and that's where we feel self-assessments help in understanding yourself, right? So our theory of change at the change goal is that once an individual has a better understanding of who they are, are they better able to move forward with clarity and confidence and, you know, remain resilient in times mm. of flow because mm. we know what, makes us out, get us out of flow, what makes us stay in flow, what's our best working environments, et cetera, et cetera. And I feel that sometimes, you know, when you're in, looking at a career change, we forget about prioritization and we forget, <laughs> forget about our decision matrix, but actually those are essential things to all go, right, right now, maybe I do need a financial runway of $100,000, right? Or whatever, $50,000. Um, and then what's the next priority, right? Is the next priority for you to get experience in the industry that you're trying to shift into or in the business that you're trying to start, right? So I think it's like creating and coming up with a decision matrix, you know, that is what is of importance to you now, right? Mm -hmm. What is important for you in six months and in 12 months? And don't worry so much about the three to five year because it can be really daunting for a lot of people, but really look at your three, six and 12 month plan and go, what are your key needs within those 12 months, right? Mm -hmm. And how can you fill those needs? Um, and if you have a financial runway, it's looking at where is your stop you know, gap, right? Where are you going to stop um, if things are not progressing, right? And for me personally, I sort of had it based on milestones, like, right, if I get a community going to XYZ number of people in XYZ, you know, um, amount of time, yeah. then I'm going to keep going. So yeah. everyone has different milestones and understanding what your limits are, but being open to having yourself be challenged. Mm. Um, and that's why I think having a community or a peer support group or something to keep challenging you is essential because we will only stay in where we are comfortable. And, um, you know, that is not going to push our limits. And yet, if you're wanting to start your own business, it's essential to start pushing your limits because you're going to be put your limits and your buttons are going to be pushed every damn day when you have to sit. And, <laughs> oh my gosh. Know, yeah, your <laughs> I, was just, I was just saying today, actually, like one, you know, first year, of your first year of business is equal to like 10 years of therapy, because honestly, yeah. it challenges you in so many ways of what you think you're capable of, what you think you're fearful about. And, you know, no job will ever give you that sort of adventure, because it's the same thing over and over again. <laughs> but entrepreneurship is like completely the opposite. It's like it's different every day. Uh, but the, the reward of that is that you have that creative control right over the outcomes uh, and the milestones you decide that you want to have. Right. Right. Um, and that is, is definitely, you know, not everything is sugar plums and gumdrops in the life yeah. of an entrepreneur. And it is a yeah. conscious choice. Right. You have to make in getting that freedom. That freedom has a cost of responsibility yeah. and that cost of resilience. Right. That you need to put into play. Um, I love the idea of what you said about breaking down your your needs and your goals in, in a, a smaller chunk of time, because we tend to sort of think about goals, especially from career counselors and uh, school counselors in, in, in the past of going, what's your five year plan? What's your 10 year yeah. plan? What's your 25 year plan? It's like, I, who knows? No wonder yeah. we're freaked out. No wonder we're nervous to declare our happiness or declare what we're excited to do, uh, because yeah. we don't know what's going to even happen a year from today, you know? Um, and so because it's such a daunting question, question, as you mentioned, most people avoid that question and don't dig any deeper because they don't have the answer. Uh, yeah. But when you break that down into smaller chunks of three, six and 12 months, 
things feel a little bit more reachable, right? In, in yeah. quarterly planning, uh, you know, there's something that you want right now. You know, there's yeah. something that isn't working for you, uh, even if you're in a dead end job or in a job that causes you burnout. Right. We work with yeah. a lot of burnout people, uh, yeah. lots of people that have gone through health uh, scares in order to uh, be the catalyst for change. Now, all those moments and experiences and stories that have come into your life are clues. Right. They yeah. are. There's insight in all of that. And there's uh, what if you know what you don't want. You're mm -hmm. just as it's just as good as knowing what you do want. <laughs> yes, so, exactly. Right. If you sort of explore that question that way, um, yeah. you will probably very likely know what what are some deep interests or some things that you may want to explore because of the meltdown or the breakdown yeah. uh, that you've you've had. Uh, so I'm glad you brought out chunk it down, make those goals smaller and be more realistic. Right. In yes. the way that you you create those milestones so that you're not waiting to celebrate when you have a launch of a business or when you reach your yeah. first six figure, you know, gig, you're actually yeah. celebrating yeah. faster, right? Like I got to know some of my deep interests this month and that's a win. Yes, right? exactly. And those wins are things that will keep you going. And I think that is something we're always mapping out the big wins, right? And we're always celebrating the big wins, but we should be celebrating every day. Mm. Um, so that's really important. Absolutely. Um, and, and also, I think when we go through transition, it's really, really important to actually dedicate time for that transition. We go, we, you know, one of the things yes. I always see happening with people is they leap from quitting a job straight into starting a business or straight into, mm -hmm. I don't know, freelance work or like they just keep going. And actually, you yeah. need a break. You need a break. You know, Sophie, I'm talking to you because you're in the chat box saying that, <laughs> you, you know, um, uh, you, you know, you quit your job at the end of July because I would wake up with a depressed feeling. I think I reached a threshold right in my tolerance yeah. for unhappiness totally get you sophie i had a complete meltdown as well myself when i when i left my job um and we actually need to it's almost like breaking up with somebody <laughs> we need time to just be like how wh what happened why am i divorcing this job and what have i learned from this divorce you know of this job uh and what do i want more of and actually taking a bit of a sabbatical i'm a huge <laughs> fan of sabbaticals um where you take 30 days, if you can have that 30 days and actually just do nothing, don't think about a business plan, don't think about what that next thing is for you and actually let yourself have a break of not doing anything so that when you are filling time consciously, right, with the right things that you want to spend energy on, you're a little bit more mindful right mm. about what it is that you're spending time on versus rushing into things, right, which I think is important. Um, now, Grace, um, one of the big questions we always have about people sort of choosing, you know, one of the things you guys do at the Change School is help people find that next North Star, right, of a career. Right. And it doesn't have to be entrepreneurship, right? Like it, it yeah. may actually, you know, what you're most interested in is just happiness at yeah. work and happiness and work as a contribution of purpose and meaning. Uh, so I'm sure you get this question a lot because I get this question a lot uh, <laughs> is that, you know, people are always asking about how do we pick between uh, our career or business ideas that make really great money, right? Something I'm yeah. used to, I'm a doctor, I'm whatever, right? Something that makes excellent money uh, yeah. versus this whole thing of following our passions uh, is such a sexy word to use, right? Passion and follow our passion. But it is, there's lots of sort of misconception, I think, around that word. Uh, word. Um, what is your advice for people that sort of go, should I choose the idea that makes me the ton of money and find meaning and, and happiness elsewhere? Or should I choose passion? But maybe it's a little harder to get to the money because usually things that are, we're passionate about, we almost feel shameful to charge yeah. for or guilty to charge for. Um, yeah. What has been your advice when you get that question? You know, I, I look at it and I go, <clears throat> it's always really hard. So I consider myself a bit of a multi-hyphenate, right? Because I have so many passions, but not all of my passions should be turned into business opportunities. Probably they could. Um, but I think something is like, it's, you know, passion is what gets you started and purpose is what keeps you going. And I, I always say this, but, you know, when people talk about purpose, they're like, oh, shit, it's such a big word. No, actually, it's about what gives you meaning. Right. Mm -hmm. And if you haven't read, definitely read the book, The Purpose Economy by, uh, gosh, I can't remember his name, but yeah. it's called The Purpose Maybe Economy. We'll put the uh, link for it, but I'll put the Purpose and Economy book on the It's chapters. great because he talks about a janitor who... Mm -hmm. um, finds purpose or meaning in his work because he's a janitor at a hospital. And when he asked him, he said that um, he is cleaning the floors of those in need. 
Mm. So, you know, I think when I get asked that question, I look at it and I go, we have so we can have multiple purposes too, right? Um, and, you know, something is really about writing a vision statement, right? Of like, what gives you, what is that person? Like, do what do you want to be, do, have, you know, what do you envision for yourself? Mm. And, you know, I look at it as like passion is going to get you started, right? That drive, that motivation, motivation, that desire comes from a burning passion. But to keep you going, and if you're running your own business, you need more than passion because passion is not going to be there when you've got like five dollars in your bank account and you're That's eating right. ramen noodles, right? <laughs> um, and you, I mean, those are certain things that you need to be realistic. Right. Two is, I think it doesn't need to be one or the other necessarily. And how do you balance having a little bit of both, right? Um, mm. You know, I think it's 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 integrating certain key elements that you need, which is why it's also going back to what are your needs, right? What are your immediate needs? How are you going to feed or get to your immediate needs now? And then how are you going to slowly cut back when those needs are being met so that you can meet your other needs, right? Mm -hmm. And we always say when you look at a job description, it's never a hundred percent match. Right. But you need to know, is it a 60 percent match with what you want? Is it a 50 percent match? Is it a 72 percent match? And what about the organization? How does the organization match you? Right. And those are things that are going to be very different to each person, depending on priorities, depending on, you know, their values, depending on what they're why they're looking for a change. So, you know, why you're looking for a change will tell you whether you should start with the purpose side. Right. Or the money side. Yep. Um, that will help shape you because if you're looking for a change because you're just bored, well, then that's not a strong enough need yeah, that right. you're going to make the change to something that you're really passionate about, right? Ooh. And if you're wanting to make a change just because you want more money, which is fine, each to their own, then again, it's not going to be based on passion. It's going to be like, which job is going to make me the most money now? So I, I think, you know, passion and purpose are interchangeable as well, but I do feel that, um, don't worry so much if it's your passion or it's your or your purpose. Just what if you wake up in the morning, what do you enjoy doing? And exactly. do you you know, that's going to get you yeah. somewhere else because you might not find your purpose for like 50 years, you know. Um, so don't don't beat yourself up on trying to find something that's like yeah. your super passion or purpose about. Do you find that there's sort of, uh, you know, when people talk about the word passion, they, they sort of hope for a Gandhi moment, right? It's like I wake up one day and yeah. like, you know, uh, something right. happens to me. I have a near death experience and I, you know, I know my purpose, but actually, you know, passion and purpose is, is an, it's actually something you cultivate, something you can yeah. create in your work or in your life, right? In yeah. general, hopefully you're being passionate and purposeful in other areas of your life. You know, work is a huge piece. I mean, you and I uh, are, are, are types of people that are designed where we can't get up in the morning unless we <laughs> care about the thing we do. Um, yes. We really suck as an employee or, or as a business owner if the thing that we're doing doesn't doesn't sort of, we're not, we're, we don't have a deep interest. I like the, using the, the word deep interest a lot more than passion uh, because that mm -hmm. feels so um, romanticized, right? In a lot of ways. And I have to feel this like desire to show up for work. And sometimes the passion could just be, I want to stay home with my kids. Yes. Do you know, like yes. I want to be home and raise my children and I'm passionate about my family and my yes. job or my career or my business helps me do that. And yes. that's why I'm passionate to wake up in the morning, you know, and that can absolutely be purpose. Um, and just to add, I think it's like we have so many different we're so multidimensional, mm -hmm. right? So work cannot fill all of us. Right. Right. And so, like you said, I think that is spot on. Right. It's like different aspects of your life will fill different cups. Mm hmm. Yeah, totally. And also we are in that, um, you know, most of us uh, will, as, as we already mentioned in the beginning of this uh, uh, chat show, is that the, the statistic, right, tells us that actually lots of us will have so many jobs that when we even hit the age of 42, which is, you know, not that long in our careers, which is mid-career, really, uh, because we are changing. We are multifaceted. We are multidimensional humans that have many interests and actually our skills are can be leveraged into different contributions of work, right? Volunteer work is one, um, paid jobs or one, collaborations, whatever it is that we choose to do. So we're in this sort of gig economy. We're in uh, the, the, mm -hmm. the, the era of portfolio careers. We're actually yes. being multi-passionate is a good thing because it actually allows you to do more and impact more into the world. And the paid gigs are just one of your contributions, right? And so um, 
sometimes I think, you know, if you have a passion that can't be, for example, can't be monetized, or you don't actually want to taint it with turning into a business, you love to paint, Mm -hmm. but you don't really want to sell paintings for a living, don't do that. You know, pick another passion or pick another deep interest, right? That's going to allow you to make money because the business uh, is really created to solve a problem and to serve. If it doesn't serve another human other than yourself, you pretty much just have a hobby, right? (laughs) You don't really have a business. Yeah, cool. Um, Thanks for for giving us your insight on that. Um, So for people who have been sort of climbing the corporate ladder, have have spent years, right? We're talking talking about passion, you know, that was sort of something people always talk about is that I have been a nurse or a doctor or a lawyer for 25 years and I was passionate about it, you know, so they've climbed the corporate ladder, they've spent years mastering uh, their field. And let's say at year 20, uh, they no longer are interested in being a lawyer or something happened, you know, in their careers. So I don't think this is for me anymore. You know, I've fallen out of love with the career that I've chased um, for 20 years. Um, How do we then expand to these sort of different horizons without feeling like we've wasted 20 years of our life? How do we utilize uh, what we have sort of already um, cultivated and and grown with uh, in order to take us to the next chapter of our career? Yeah, I think, look, um, that's a great question. I think there is no such thing as wasted time um, unless you're really just honestly sitting at home for a year doing absolutely nothing. But even then, I think that like like Lydia shared, right, um, you know, having that time in sabbatical is essential because so often we just jump from one thing to another. So if you're in that position where you have been in a position that you have loved, that you have dedicated your life to all of these sort of things, one, take, take time, time out, out. <laughs> right? I, I think, think it's, it's like, like if you, you can, can remove yourself from your everyday environment um, and really take things from a different perspective, like creative sabbaticals or sabbaticals in general are really important, but it's also not just taking a sabbatical as an escapism, it's taking a sabbatical to be mindful that what you're doing is taking time for yourself to recalibrate, review, reassess, and just reconnect with yourself. And, you know, I did that not long ago, um, you know, just for a four day, it doesn't have to be a 30 day sabbatical, right? right? Like, I mean, you know, we don't all have those times, but I do think 30 days are essential if you're shifting on a big, on a big, big stage. But for me, I have mini sabbaticals every quarter usually. And that is just to reconnect with myself. So I think first of all, for you guys, it's reconnecting, re recalibrating who you are, right? And then relooking at, you know, who do you want to be, Mm. right? Or what do you want to become in this next uh, reinvention of yourself, right? Mm. You are now back into a caterpillar, you're just a caterpillar, and you're going to blossom right from there on, or uh, sorry, in a cocoon, and you're going to blossom from there on, right? Um, You know, I think the other is to look at your career assets, because most of the time there are three career assets, right? One is your job related or technical skills that we get for if you're like a web designer or yeah, a doctor or certain skills that you must have technical um, experience or certification around. Second is your transferable skills. Mm-hmm. Those are assets that make up majority of us, right? Um, no matter what job or industry you're in. And those can be transferred from one industry to another easily. Um, and they are yours to have, right? So um, the last one is our personal assets um, or characteristics, right? And those are more um, your personality, your interests, your, that makes the base of us. So we always have a pyramid where the bottom is our personality, our characteristics, right? Our personal assets. And that is also what's going to get you a position or a foot in the door because that unique selling point, Mm -hmm. let's say. The second is transferable skills, because it doesn't matter if the industry that you're in has died and those technical skills are no longer relevant. Well, you have transferable skills that you can shift for the next 500 years because they are skills that are always going to be of value. Can you give us some examples of these transferable skills so that people can start prompting that in their heads? Yeah, sure. So it's like um, negotiation skills, right? Time management skills, Mm. um, you know, uh, organizational skills, right? Um, Leadership skills, um, you know, relationship, managing relationships, all of these sort of things. And there's like hundreds and hundreds of transferable skills. And, you know, when you're at that point, it's reassessing your career assets from a 
say I've worked in this industry for X amount of period of time to going, I have these assets that I have built mm. along the journey and where can these assets take me and how can I package and craft my story for the future direction that I want to go in, picking up the key assets that I want to take into this next stage of my life. Yeah. Absolutely, because a lot of times in a, in a span of a twenty year career, you 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 have built a body of work, right? And a lot, and your yeah. body of work is not just only the work that's specific to a particular industry. It's sort of everything that you've done that has some common themes, right? There are sometimes ties yes. that binds, uh, like you know, if you look at my resume, it sort sort of looks like it's for three people. Like I've been in multiple industries because. I lose interest really quickly, which should have been the biggest sign that I should have been an entrepreneur. Uh, but, um, but if you actually looked at what I did in the roles of each position, uh, it was always, always related to um, growing another human in some way, yeah. right? Like, like helping to do something bigger with another human. I was never a sort of desk job kind of girl. You know, I had to be out in the field in some way, yeah. uh, connecting with humans, uh, you know, helping motivate or, or doing something that changes the mind of someone. And, and, you know, sales jobs, everything that I've been in had that element, right. Of, 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 of mindset shift or belief shifting, right. In order to do a good job in that yeah. role. And I think, um, it's so, it's such a good point to look beyond the job titles, you know, mm -hmm. and really actually totally. dig into like, yeah, if you call yourself an accountant or you call yourself a lawyer, like fine. So is everyone else. What do you, mm -hmm. do, what do you do differently? That makes you a great lawyer, right? Like some, sometimes yeah. it could be your, you know, your empathic skills. Right. Yes. Or you're great at like um, dealing with your great conflict resolution individual, yeah. you know, yeah. or like whatever it is, that you, how you performed at that job becomes actually your asset rather than the job title itself. Would you agree? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Awesome. If you guys have any questions, by the way, uh, about uh, career sh changing or any really any questions for Grace and myself, because we're going to be winding up this uh, chat show very soon. Uh, we have a few questions that came in by email, which I'll, I'll uh, definitely ask uh, Grace to in the Q&A session. But we will be going to Q&A in the next five minutes or so. So uh, don't forget to click on the ask a question tab below the video to submit your questions so we can timestamp it for you uh, when you watch the replay. Uh, and also we can just make sure we're organized in the questions when we go through them uh, but we do have a, a, couple, a short list of questions that have been sent over by email but if you're joining us live please enter that into the ask a question tab as well um, okay grace thank you so much by the way for giving us so much insight and wisdom about uh career transitions um was there any sort of last advice for people who are just kind of like one foot in one foot foot out of their career transition it's like i kind of want to go i don't know when it is <laughs> when's the perfect time like you know just sort of like in and out in and out constantly and not really committing to that change um what would be your advice for someone that's sitting on a you know in that crossroad or sitting on the fence i think something that i would ask yourself is how would you feel if you did nothing and you stayed right where you are right mm -hmm. um you know what is that feeling that you would have inside and how does that how does that then translate into you making or committing and taking action in some way um, so really you know sit with you know where you are right now and be like do I envision myself here for the next maybe 10 years yeah and if I am too scared to make it and I'm gonna stay here for the next 10 years or whoever knows how is that gonna make you feel mm. right and then do the opposite and go you know, imagine yourself living the life that you have been dreaming about, right? No matter how outrageous it is, but imagine yourself in those shoes and see how you would feel then, right? It might might take a bit of time because you might, we, we sometimes struggle feeling yeah. um, and we are numb and that's fine, but really ask yourself those two questions. Mm. How would you feel if you stayed where you are right now? forever, mm -hmm. right? And then go to the next extreme. If you were living and imagining yourself in the footsteps of where you want to be, how would that make you feel? Yeah, I love that question. And also a lot of times when we talk about risks, we are always thinking about the risk of doing the new thing, right? But yeah. we never talk about the risk of remaining as so, right? Like yes. what's the risk that can happen to your life in 10 years if nothing changes? <laughs> how do you feel? What do you now experience, you know? Uh, and I always yeah. love to sort of look at the people like, 
you know, that did this before me, like looking at my own boss's life and going, yeah. I don't want that life. Like that, that was a pretty big clue as to I was working towards a career I, or a trajectory of a career I didn't really want to have, but you don't really question yes. it as much. So yeah. I think taking that pause and right, asking yourself the risks of not making changes is also yes. a risk, right? And indecision yes. is a decision after all. Absolutely. So we have to admit that that big, big one to ourselves yeah. for sure. Uh, excellent yeah. uh, parting advice. Uh, now let's go into a bit of Q&A before we end this uh, chat show. And, and Sophie had a question uh, about changing jobs. So um, Sophie asked, I've been changing jobs more than 10 times. Uh, how can I know that the next career change will be long lasting? What's your thoughts on that, Grace? <laughs> um, Sophie, I love all your questions. And thank you, first of all, for sharing, um, you know, and, and just sharing with everyone. You know, I think something we get this a lot um, and no change is for certain. Um, and we should not expect it to be for certain. Right. Mm. Because we do not know. I mean, it's like, you know, we can we are all works in progress. Right. Um, and we we don't know for sure how long we want to stay in one career or how long you might run a business or how long you might be in a relationship with someone, you know, those are things that we cannot know for certain. Um, however, and I think something to know is that it's not a straight line. It's a little squiggly line all over the place. Right. And so we may start on that path to that career that we're shifting into, but the more open we are to opportunities and possibilities, something else might come our way that is uh, similar to what we're looking for that drives our purpose and our passion side of things, but may take us in a different direction. Mm. So, um, you know, I think that's one of the things people want for certainty, want certainty, right? They literally want certainty to the point where it's like, I need to know whether this is the career for life, but change is the only constant in life, right? There is, and there is no certainty in pretty much anything we do. If, if that was the case, we'd all be fortune tellers, I think, <laughs> yeah, that's right? Funny. We'd all be gambling. We'd probably be like, I know I'm going to win $15 million tomorrow. Mm. So I think it's just, I think it's being okay with not knowing for certain that this career direction is forever. And the thing is, is that, you know, and also being okay with the fact that if you don't like it and you've made the change, you can change again. That's and the right. more confident you are with change and being adaptable to change, it's going to be easy for you. It's not going to be a whole stressful period again. And because you're going to have tools that are going to empower you and enable you to thrive in moments of change. So I think it's just going in with a beginner's mindset, right? But a growth mindset and as well, and being able to be open to the possibilities um, and that will that will help you mm. to just feel more confident. I don't know, maybe Lydia, you have some other no, things as I, well. I love that advice. And, and you know, one of the things I always use with my coaching clients as well is like, what is the right for right now career for you, right? Yeah. Based on what you were talking about, these needs, right? That's why we have to sort of recalibrate and plan out in shorter term because yeah, just like you said with Sophie, it's like, you don't, nothing's forever and we can't yeah. make decisions that way. And that's why you're stuck to begin with. Yes. Right? And so it's yes. okay that you've been changing jobs. First of all, take that negative mindset out of like, I fucked up and I've been a failure because yeah. I've changed jobs more than 10 times. It's okay yeah. because you're actually one of the few that have actually, you know, been adventurous and sort of became someone who was quite experimental and curious about your interests. Some people, yes. you know, die never thinking about their interests, you know, totally. they just sort of stick with something forever. So that's a positive thing, Sophie, that you're actually yeah. taking that responsibility to yourself and doing that. Now you might be in your stage of life that you're looking for something more sustainable, right? Something yeah. that is going to maybe you have children or your family and that life has changed a little bit more for you. And that's okay to say that too, that my next career change may be something that I have interest in. It may not be my top passion, but it might be something that needs to bring in enough money for me that is going to allow me to um, feed my kids, right? And that's yeah. more in higher priority in my life stage right now than in my 20s, when I yes. could actually just try a bunch of stuff and not worry about it, because I'm happy to backpack around the world and just feed hand to mouth sort of thing, you know, so yeah. um, I think we have to be honest about what is the right for right now, you know, change for ourselves. Uh, and yeah. as uh, Grace, you know, talked about earlier on in this chat show, really understand what you need right in your life right now and if it is money it's okay to say that too yeah you know and take yeah. on a gig 
temporarily to be able to feed yourself and be financially free and then pursue a passion project that may not bring in income, but you're not suffering, right? And pressure to have shelter and food on the table when you're doing so. Yeah. Yeah. Excellent. Uh, second question is from Jen. Um, let me just click the start answering button so we get a timestamp. This is time really crazy, but I'm going to move you guys because my battery <laughs> charger is not oh, charged. No so worries. So just follow me right to the other side of my desk, um, <laughs> which is really easy, but I just was like, I can't let this die. Sorry, that is very yeah. unprofessional. Oh gosh, no me. worries. Uh, we've had, I've told you before when we started this webinar that I've had, when we did master, we do masterminds sometimes through Zoom and a platform like this. I've got, you know, clients that are breastfeeding while we do these things, right? So that's okay. <laughs> and we've done it's just, that. We it's just the other side of the desk. Yeah, so that's you're fine. <laughs> uh, so Jen's question uh, is, hi, Grace and Lydia. Uh, Grace, thank you for your in, sharing your insights on career uh, transitions. I have a two part question. Uh, I would like to know how those closest to you responded to your decision to make the leap. Uh, and in terms of those who responded with fear or negativity, how did you nav navigate that, especially with those who cannot, we cannot cut out of our lives, certain people like family and spouse? Yeah, I think that's a really, really good question. Um, look, I wasn't married at the time that I made some big decisions. Um, and so I think first off, you know, uh, okay, how do I deal with negative people, right? The first part of the question was uh, people, okay, well, actually, I got a story. When I first moved back to Singapore in 09 to set up my first business, um, everyone around me was working in a corporate job. And they were all like, what the hell are you doing? Why are you moving to Singapore, <clears throat> one of the most expensive cities, and setting up your own business? What in the hell has gone wrong with you? And, you know, it used to frustrate the hell out of me because, sure, it, was, it wasn't easy. But when everyone, and these are people I went to school with, right? When, when everyone around you is like, what are you doing? That's actually where I started to feel isolated. Mm. Um, but I, I'm a bit stubborn. So again, my, my personality is to be like, you think I can't do it? I'm going right. to prove you wrong and I'm going to do it. Yeah. Right. So I have that stubbornness in me and sometimes the overconfident side of things. Um, but what I did was I ended up starting my own community. And that's how I got into community building. Mm. Right. Was because I ended up missing that from what I, I needed that. I needed a community that I could connect with. And that's when I built Secret Women's Business, which was for women entrepreneurs and change makers who are you know, aspiring or current entrepreneurs. And, and that is something that I needed. Um, so with regards to that, if people around you are not supporting you, find support groups. We are now in a world where we are so amazingly connected online. And I have, you know, Facebook groups, I have mastermind groups, I'm in so many different things. I mean, you know, Lydia's got the Facebook group, um, unconventional, the unconventionalists, right? I mean, we have a group of 700 plus career shifters. And these groups provide you a community when others around you physically may not be able to provide you that community. And I think, you know, a sense of belonging is essential in any stage of our life, whether you're a new mother, whether you're changing careers, whether you're, you know, had cancer, whatever it is, communities are essential. Um, so I think finding that. Two, what happens with naysayers or people who are there, they are not in my five C's of people, first of all, right? Like we talk about five circles of influence and impact. When you're looking to make a change, you need to find these people that are going to uplift you and support you and help you in moving forward rather than hindering you. And, um, you know, I, I do feel that sometimes the people that I believe that, you know, like that saying says, we are the average of the five people we support ourselves with. And oh. if, if it's your spouse, um, what I would suggest is maybe finding someone that you could speak to um, or look at how you're sharing the information. So making it come from, I need, I need to do this in order to make me feel X, oh. right? Um, and so, you know, if you can find that middle person, a counselor or whatever it is that can help you, because if it's really important to you, then I think that's essential for you to be able to communicate it. And it's not so much what you say, it's how you say it. Um, you know, to 
if it's people, you don't have to cut them out, but you don't need to tell them everything, That's right? right? Like I'm consciously <laughs> choosing who you tell things to, right? Exactly. Yeah. You know, like my mother is like, I mean, very Asian in that sense. And <laughs> was so. like, what did you do? <laughs> why did you not get it? Yeah. Why did you not yeah. become a lawyer? Or my friends <laughs> married a person with an MBA. I mean, love my mom to death, but I got that my entire life. Sure. Right. So, um, but I don't share with my mom. I'm like, yeah, everything's fine. You don't need to know. There yeah. are certain things that I do not share because I know it's going to make me feel uncomfortable um, and get annoyed because they're not able to see my side of things. So I don't know if that helps. It doesn't mean you have to cut them out, but if they are really toxic, then you do. Sometimes yeah. And if you can people, cut them out, you have to. I mean, you. I think when we go through a life transition, it's, ha it's the same thing when you go through a divorce and things like that too. You start to realize who around you is still there for you. You know. Yeah. Um, and I definitely had to have a, a recalibration of my friendship groups because lots. You yeah. know, I, I quit my job during like the, a recession. You know, d during a time where my friends were laid off. You know, and there was yeah. a lot of shame behind. Uh, giving up a six-figure salary and doing this entrepreneurship thing for no reason while other people are losing their jobs and losing their homes, right? It's not something that's really nice to experience. Um, your naysayers are your, your mother and your grand grandmother, which is really hard. Uh, and that that those are people that is harder to cut off, right? And so I think Grace's advice about choosing who you speak to around your transition. Because in the beginning, when you're doing that that transition, uh, Jen, everything feels scary, right? Y your ground is really shaky. Nothing feels solid. So all the more you actually really need cheerleaders in your corner rather than just like anyone, right, around yeah. you. Because any anything could tip you over <laughs> at this point. Because you are going to be scared and you are going to be vulnerable and you're going to need more support than you will need naysayers, obviously. Um, so you have to be very conscious about about who you start telling your escape plan to or who you start telling your goals to, especially grandma, you know, who has lived in a different yeah. era. <laughs> like, you know, like, she was like happy to be in a home where it's safe and there's no wars happening, right? Like that, that's her baseline needs <laughs> during yeah. her time. And so she, grandma is not going to be the right person to talk about entrepreneurship or talk about anything risky. She probably came from the depression, you know, like, you know, Jen's like grandma was a housewife her entire life. So uh, for sure. So you talked to grandma about other things. You talked to grandma <laughs> about your love for travel, you know, your love for being a creative person, right? And you, you stick to the conversations that grandma can contribute to. You know, I do the same with my, my mom, right? She's lovely and amazing. But if I tell her something about my financial, you know, oh, stress yeah. about something, she's like, oh my God, you've ruined your life. Um, you know, and I now have to give you like my will and give you more money because you'll die without me, you know, and she'll sort of make up all these sort of dramatic um, stories. And I don't talk to my mom about stuff like that, right? So you do have to consciously choose who you speak to. Uh, the second thing, Jen, is to also know that if these naysayers are people your age, you know, like your colleagues, your friends, uh, your community of people, um, you have to realize that when people express their fear, it's a lot of a lot of it is a projection of their own beliefs, right? So when you say someone they know for a long time, right? I grew up with Jen. I've known her for twenty years. We had the same trajectory of a life, and all of a sudden she's changing her mind. She's starting to hate her job, or she's starting to dream bigger. Something yeah. that's now different from the Jen I know, you know, in in our reality. Um, it scares people when you change. You know, it's because they've been with you for so long and you guys have been friends, right? So when you make a shift in your life, it sort, sort of in a way sometimes makes them evaluate their own lives mm -hmm. where they might say, you know what, I'm not that happy with my job either, or I'm not that happy in my relationships either, or whatever it is that's missing from their lives, your your own bravery to pursue a different life causes them sometimes to look at their own, either in a brave, courageous way, you know, or it triggers them. And you will yeah. trigger people in a, in your transition. And so you can either choose to look at it as a negative thing. They're trying to like ruin your parade, you know, or you can sort of go, they're just scared like me. Mm -hmm. And that's just what it is. And they're human too. Uh, and what I can do is that, hey, I can acknowledge that it is scary. You can even say, I know it's kind of scary, but here's my motivation. Here's my reason why I'm still pursuing this dream, you know, and then thank them for their concern, right? acknowledge that they just want to help you, but actually don't take it to heart and know that they just have to say those things to make themselves feel better about what the choices that they've made as well. 
Yeah. Okay. Uh, great, Jen. It's like that has verbatim been said to me, Lydia. I think you're a touch psychic. Uh, yeah, I think it's it's it, you know I, I've been through it enough times to know that that sort of um, you know what we have what what we have to go through. Uh, all right. So I'm mindful of time. So we we want to sort of make sure that you get the resources that you need uh, for your own career transitions uh, that you're going through right now. One of the resources that I'm providing for you today is our free three part video series uh, on how to quit the nine to five and create your path to freedom. It's going to help you create actually understand the reason why you want to take your leap and so that when you're faced with these naysayers you understand on a deep level why you are taking this leap and so you can articulate that clearly uh, and you can absolutely um, be able to be belief in what you're doing first before you start to have other people believe in this new dream you have uh, it's also going to help you prepare for your transition so there's money preparation there's mindset preparation uh there's what the hell you're going to do outside of the cubicle if you were to quit preparation uh so that this is my free gift to you today uh to help you to um get that started now grace do you have any resources to share as part of the change school uh and and bettina can share that in our chat box uh and also uh where can people find you to learn more about how they can work with you at the change school as well Sure. So, I mean, you know, um, we have a uh, Change School TV, which is on our YouTube channel, or um, you can binge watch a range of different topics um, around there. And within each of our different episodes, there are things that you can um, that you can download um, as well. And, and we do share stories, I think, you know, that are complementary as well to what Lydia does in Screw the Cubicle as well. So, um, you know, I think one of the things for us is our signature course, um, How to Confidently Create Your Bold Career Move, is um, has rolling intakes. And that's just at bit.ly forward slash um, bold career. And um, so, you know, if that's something that looks like you're, you're needing or wanting, do check it out. But otherwise, we're at thechangeschool.com. You know, so if you want, subscribe to our newsletter and we'll be able to share more resources with you. But our YouTube channel might be something that you can just easily watch at your own time and, you know, really go through topics around fear or mindset change and, you know, um, network building, tribe building, all of these sort of things that are essential for a career change. Excellent. Uh, so go to thechangeschool.com. That's sort of where you'll get all the great resources. Uh, Salonia and Grace spend so much time and energy researching like how people think. Uh, they do it so often that they're just like in your brain and they are just the most... Um, generous people I've ever met, like, honestly, within this industry. So that's why we love and we get along so well, because, you know, we have a huge passion about ejecting people from like, yeah. mundane jobs, <laughs> and mundane lives. But really, these girls are so or ladies, I should say, uh, are, are, are so passionate about what they do. And they're so involved and invested uh, in the mission for the change school that I really hope you check them out and support their work. Uh, and they have tons of stuff around going through change hence the change school, uh, a lot more than I've ever created around change. They specialize in change and emotional change and transition. Um, so definitely watch their videos and, and um, say hello to them at the change school. Um, now, Thank you very much for joining us. I know uh, we're on sort of like uh, dinner time and Pacific time zone. So if you're watching us over dinner, uh, feeding the kids, uh, we appreciate your time uh, and supporting uh, always our, our, our trainings here. Now, you're going to be getting a, an email with the replay as well with uh, Grace's links to that free course she, she talked about, uh, with this, which is making your bold career move and the links to her website on that email. Uh, but we love to, we would love to get a reply from you. If you have any big questions that we didn't get a chance to answer in this webinar chat show, just hit reply. It literally gets into my inbox. I read every email. Uh, so I will make sure to reply to you if, if we didn't get your questions answered or if Grace can answer it better, I will forward it to Grace's email. Uh, but we also would love to learn uh, what you want to learn for our next Tribe Talk and webinar training. We always love to listen to feedback and make sure that we are producing content that are really relevant for your change and your transition uh, and your path to an unconventional life. Uh, thank you guys very much for joining us. Thank you, Grace, for being so generous with your time. Um, and uh, see you next time in our next Tribe Talk. Thanks, everybody. Bye, Thanks, Grace. Bye. Thanks, Thanks, guys. Bye. Bye. Bye.